Well, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome back to Congress being in session, or at least the Senate being in session. I'm sure you've followed all some of the um, antics in, in the House. Um, been a busy week, uh, the first week already. I'm sure we'll get to some of the topics like uh, uh, concerns about the uh, Justice Department's holdup of giving the intelligence community the oversight they need on the documents found at Trump and Biden's house. But uh, um, let me get to two or three topics on the front end, then we'll be happy to take your questions. First and foremost, um, the debt ceiling. You know, this is a Challenging issue. Some of you who've been around a while recall that for um, many years, uh, in a previous debt debate, I was part of the effort around the so-called Simpson Bowles effort, and 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 very familiar with uh, the challenges, but also the ramifications if we don't get this right. The notion that we would put the full faith and credit of the United States in jeopardy um, at this moment of of economic uncertainty, with the rise of China, with the challenges of the Russia-Ukraine war, is beyond the pale. It's just plain crazy that anyone would suggest doing this. Yet, unfortunately, you have this group in the House who very much seems to be proposing that. Um, and let me be clear, the debt ceiling is not about future spending obligations. It's basically saying, are we going to pay the bills that the Congress has already authorized and appropriated? Uh, you, you can't midstream on your car payments say, I'm not going to pay uh, this year because I, I, don't, I don't want to. Or you can do it and you become bankrupt. Um, the ramifications of, of saying that we're not going to pay our bills would be the height of irresponsibility. It would raise interest rates dramatically. That would affect anyone who owns a home, anybody who's got student debt, any business that's got any debt obligations. It would throw into uncertainty um, the fact of the dollar as a reserve currency. And, and if you hadn't owned stocks, it would be carnage in the stock markets. So I find the uh, House Republican position untenable. Uh, they are out there saying they they want to cut, and listen, they've got control of the House. I think they ought to lay out their plan on how they would go about um, dealing with the debt ceiling on cuts only. And the hypocrisy of this is that when President Trump was there, when, frankly, the level of debt went up at a level unprecedented, uh, the Congress extended the debt ceiling three times without any of this kind of you know, fiscal terrorism. Um, so I hope uh, saner heads will um, rule out. I hope that uh, more moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats can come up with a solution. Do we need to take on a host of issues, both around spending, revenues, entitlements? Absolutely, but not in the context of um, uh, this kind of political hand grenade that some extreme members of the House try to want to throw into our political system and into our economy. Uh, and the sooner we get this behind us, the better, number one. Number two, um, I think listen, we've all seen these the awfulness of these uh, recent shootings in California. And uh, I, for one, am tired of elected officials who want to simply send thoughts and prayers. That's why I, and I think Tim Kaine as well, uh, reintroduced our assault weapon ban um, that had been in place at, back in the 90s and early 2000s. It would not prevent any one of these tragedies, but as we see at least in one, I believe, of the two California shootings, it was a rapid-fire type assault weapon. Um, I think it's sensible. It was the law of the land for, uh, for decades without um, literally infringing upon a traditional Second Amendment rights, and I think it's time to bring it back. And um, well, I was proud to be part of the reintroduction of Senator Feinstein's bill uh, on that issue. Um, on, on two other quick issues, because I know there's going to be lots of questions today. Um, many of you on this line, particularly friends in Hampton Roads, have um, followed the uh, long and winding path to us getting the new VA clinic on the south side. Um, you know, the hurdles we had to go through, the fact that we went from authorization, I think, in 2016 or 17 to not actually getting built until the, it's not even fully open at this point. So I've got a, 
a veterans reform bill called the BUILD Act that would streamline and make sure whether we're talking about the new clinic and facility in Southside Virginia or for that matter the, the new facility in, in Fredericksburg area or other veterans facilities that if they get authorized and appropriated by the Congress it shouldn't take six, seven, eight years to get them built. Um, lots of technical changes, process changes, um, but I think it would be a step in the right direction and, and I'm talking to my friends on the Veterans Committee to see if we can move it. And then finally a, a piece of business is carried over from um, from last year that we passed in the Senate, and, and I'm proud to say my, my colleague Morgan Griffith from the 9th District was supportive, and that is naming uh, the music amphitheater at the, at the Blue Ridge Music Center uh, after Rick Boucher. Um, Rick Boucher was a, a great congressman from Southwest Virginia, uh, I think did a great job, uh, was well loved for, uh, by folks regardless of partisan affiliation, and I think the naming uh, of the Blue Ridge um, uh, Music Amphitheater would be a good thing. Um, I was disappointed uh, that at the end of the day some, a single individual I believe in the House held that up and was, was not anybody in the Virginia delegation. Uh, but we, I want to put that back in as well. And, and Tim and I and I've talked with um, some of our Republican friends to let's get that done to uh, honor Rick's contributions. Um, obviously lots and lots of other issues but uh, Laura, why don't I turn it over to you so we can go ahead and get started on the questions. We have quite a few questions today, so we'll do our best to get through them as quickly as possible. Senator, our first question will be from Jim Spencer with the Daily Progress. Thanks for taking the call, uh, Senator. Um, can, you, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I, Jim, I, you're cutting in and out a little bit, but I, I think I can, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, how are you going to be able to overcome the misinformation that comes about the debt limit? You know, whenever I write about it, I hear from people who are saying, well, we don't need to borrow more money, and they don't really uh, see it as being something that's already been obligated. But the other thing they, they think is going to be able to happen, and it's what the Republicans want to do, is to use it as a, 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 a leverage to negotiate spending cuts in other things perhaps even including Medicare or health care in some ways, uh, and, you know, kind of playing this game with you guys up to the, you know, like playing chicken. Um, how do you make people in, Amer in, in Virginia understand what it actually means to them, not, not just as some sort of faraway concept in Washington, D.C.? Well, Jim, thank you for the question. And, I, and I, let me just also uh, take a moment of personal privilege, I guess, would be the the comment to make and, and um, say, Jim, I have a uh, law. I know you're going to be leaving the Daily Progress shortly. Um, I have huge respect for you, your time in the Daily Press, your time the Daily Progress. You know, you've been a stalwart of, of Virginia journalism for a long time. I have not always agreed with you, and Lord knows you've not always agreed with me, but you've always been straight and truthful. And, I, you know, and, and on, on one way, before we get to the debt ceiling itself, I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is, the, frankly, the decimation of our local press corps. We're seeing the decimation of locally owned and locally controlled newspapers. You know, we had a piece of legislation that was actually some bipartisan support that would have, frankly, stopped some of the stranglehold that some of the big social media platforms have on, on, on news distribution that would at least say somewhat similar to Australia uh, that, um, you know, if you're getting news off of a, a local newspaper, you, you ought to reimburse some of those costs if it's on Apple News or Facebook News. Um, and having a strong local journalism um, core uh, is one of the ways because local journalists, I think, have greater respect from their local community and not going to solve everything, but it is a real, I think, tragedy across Virginia, across the country that we're losing so many local outlets and, and great journalists. Um, let me speak to the, the specific issue. I, I think we got to relentlessly make the comment, make the statement that this is not about new spending. This is about paying our bills. And I believe you've got uh, virtually uniform agreement from everyone in the financial sector, 
Uh, I think the ideas, I, I know as I was in Warrington last week and a couple of folks stood up and said, you know, I'm concerned about this, but I'm concerned about what it's going to do my, you know, an older gentleman, you know, about my stock market portfolio. And, you know, it is, this is not an if, and, or but presumption. It is a, a uh, dead set fact. You, the stock market, stock market will be a carnage if we even get close to this debt ceiling. Uh, I think the, the fact of what it will do to jobs, I think the, the business community and others need to help m make that case as well. And, and the hypocrisy of this. We, we raised the debt ceiling three times under President Trump uh, without any fight at all. Now, I'm, I'm actually um, fairly optimistic in a certain extent because of even Leader McConnell, uh, Republican Senate leader's comments saying, all right, guys, you in the House, you got control of the House, show us your plan. Uh, I heard on, I'm going to copy from my friend, my former colleague Claire McCaskill has said something on one of the TV shows today. This kind of debt ceiling plan that the House Republicans uh, have talked about, they ought to put up what their plan is. It is oddly familiar to the um, repeal and replace arguments around Obamacare. There was never a replace program in place. So I think at some point the American people saw through that and for all the challenge around Obamacare decided to keep that since they offer, were really offered no alternative. When the MAGA House Republicans offer their plan of draconian cuts, particularly at a, a moment when you've even got President Trump said, don't, don't cut benefits in Medicare and Social Security, let's have them put up or shut up. And um, you know, you know, I'm sure there'll be conversations about this, but they're the ones who are threatening to throw this political hand grenade. It is time for them to put up or shut up. Show us how you will do this. And then let the American people make the judgment. Um, and, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I know this issue inside and out. I, I know we've got to come back on some of our, again, particular issues like Social Security and make sure there is, it is fiscally sound for the next 50 years. And I've got some ideas on that. But it ought to not be done in the context of this kind of, again, uh, political hand grenade around the debt ceiling, particularly when it is, it is a unforced error. This is a, not a constitutional requirement. This is, you know, again, money that has been spent. Uh, and uh, I, I think, you know, similar to the repeal and replace around Obamacare, okay, House Republicans, show us your plan. And then we ought to debate that plan. Again, Senator, our next question will be Felicity Taylor with CBS 19. Hi, Senator. My uh, question is about the assault weapons ban um, and how would that have impacted the situation at UVA? And what are your thoughts on the current legislation moving through the General Assembly right now? Well, uh, I'm not, you know, again, sure on the particulars of the tragedy that took place at UVA. Um, in terms of what weapon w was used. I do know that the assault weapon ban, uh, and I'm going to get you relatively dates, but it was, I think, initially passed in 1994. It was in place until um, 2008, 2010, I believe, time frame. I may be a little off on the back end. Uh, didn't stop every kind of violent crime uh, and some of these heinous shootings. Um, but it was the, the number of shootings that were taking place with assault weapons I, during that period was actually less than clearly what's happened going forward. So um, one tool in the toolkit, again, uh, I, I think that um, we've got a, Tim Kaine and I have got a much more comprehensive approach and we're going to be laying that out later. But I don't want to say that any single law is going to stop uh, these kind of tragedies. And let me be the first to acknowledge that you know, reasonable restrictions on guns isn't going to do it alone. We need you know, substantial additional investment in mental health. What I find frustrating, and what I find frustrating from you know, some of my Republican friends in the General Assembly, is that they will talk about the mental health needs, and I support those efforts to increase funding and access to mental health. I think the 988 on a national basis number around both mental health and suicide prevention is a good step forward. But I just wish they would be willing to say, yes, mental health, but also the tools that these shooters use 
Um, you know, there's a reason why we don't have this kind of mass killings in any other industrial nation in the world because, and I'm not saying we need to, to copy the European model. There is a Second Amendment. I support it. I own firearms. But the idea that there is not a place to put some reasonable restrictions in place, I just wish uh, that we would uh, have from all the members of the General Assembly and leadership in Virginia a willingness to acknowledge, yes, mental health, but also some reasonable restrictions on some of these, frankly, again, in many cases, tools of war that are being used to create tragedies on the streets of America. Senator, our next question will be Jeff Shapiro with the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Uh, Jeff? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'm here. Good morning, Governor. Um, in your capacity as um, in Intelligence Committee Chair, uh, what do you make of um, uh, Governor Youngkin's um, suggestion that, uh, in effect, the Ford Motor Company is a front for the communist Chinese, and that's why he, the governor, had to uh, torpedo negotiations with Ford over the construction of a possible construction of a, an EV um, battery plant in Pennsylvania County. I guess it's two questions. One, uh, the governor's suggestion uh, to the economic consequences uh, for Pennsylvania and Southside going forward. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you also. I, I know you don't normally uh, get on these calls, so um, I'm, I'm happy to have you participate. Um, let me do those in reverse order. Um, you know, I've been a supporter of Barry Hill for as long as I've been in, in um, you know, at least in this job. and. Obviously, when I was governor, I spent an enormous amount of time in, in Southside Virginia. I mean, remember, Southside Virginia was the place that had powered Virginia's economy um, for the first half of the 20th century and uh, had been some of the most prosperous parts of the Commonwealth. And I think it, it, with the demise of, of tobacco, with the demise of traditional manufacturing, it is really incumbent that we go the extra mile to help Southside Virginia. One of the things I was proudest of. Uh, early on when I was when I was governor was when there were a series of legislators, particularly from Northern Virginia and, and frankly Hampton Roads, that wanted to take the Tobacco Commission funds, the, the monies that were set aside in the tobacco settlement, and some had been used for state purposes, some had been used um, uh, to, as a set aside for kind of a legacy to Southside to try to make the investments um, that were needed to bring those communities back when some some folks in both parties, some Democrats as well, wanted to take that money to fill the budget holes left by my predecessor, and I stood up against that. And then more recently on Berry Hill, uh, I was very proud to work with uh, Tim and, and, and Morgan and uh, a number of members uh, to make sure that Berry Hill, we got the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure they could you know, have that site become viable. So I'm all in on what we can do for Southside. In terms of, of, of the circumstance on this particular case, I've also been very clear um, for, for a some time. I just finished a joint interview with um, uh, Marco Rubio that will air on one, I think, Face the Nation this weekend. But I have huge concerns about the Chinese Communist Party's influence uh, on, on many of the companies that come from China. I mean, the CCP has the ability to override any company in China, and those companies in China have to be responsible to the Communist Party, not their shareholders, not their customers. Matter of fact, I've done 20 classified briefings, industry sector by industry sector, about um, uh, the, the, some of the concerns I have. And, you know, I'm actively engaged in some of the conversations right now about the national security concerns I have about TikTok. Um, I also know that, that in a whole host of areas, from solar to battery technology, we've got to win back and bring back some of that technology. Uh, on the specific case that was involving Ford and the Chinese company, I don't know any of, of the, uh, I don't know any of the due diligence. I don't have any of the backgrounds. I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, I will stand by my overarching comments, though, that um, you know, I don't think we need to sever all ties with China. The, we have to figure ways where we can work with them, but we do need to um, recognize that uh, uh, the CCP has an undue influence by Chinese law. Uh, over many Chinese companies. Thank you. Senator, our next question will be Michael Martz with the Richmond Times-Dispatch. 
Uh, good morning, Senator. I'm back. And he stole my thunder as usual. The, um, I'm sorry. I'll shut up. I, I, this is old home week. Go ahead. Uh, so, so I, yeah, I, I follow up on Jeff's question. Uh, I see that, uh, you know, the governor also said in his State of the Commonwealth address that there was some threat of the, the, the of China buying up Virginia farmland. They were going to stop that. And there, that, you know, there are a number of people from both sides of the aisle who said, where did that come from? Uh, but I see this morning Congresswoman Spanberger is also in her capacity on the House Agricultural Committee has also raised concern about uh, Chinese investment in agriculture. I mean, wh where do we draw the line on this? And wh how, what are you hearing about the ag? Yeah, Michael, like, like, um, first of all, uh, I think some of these reference to ag is actually due to a controversy that's been brewing for some time in North Dakota um, over Chinese purchase of a large swath of, of of land. And a, a lot of this in terms of the Chinese purchases, uh, you know, it's, it's not about China per se, in my mind, that's just my view, buying farmland, but where is that farmland? That farmland happens to be adjacent to a military installation. I think it raises questions. And I think it, it, this, and again, I keep coming back to, you know, my intelligence committee has, has been doing 20 classified briefings over a six-year, five-year time frame, briefing companies on a classified basis about some of the challenges involved with China, both in terms of intellectual property theft, in terms of how we need to compete with China on technology development, uh, and, and we've taken action. I mean, we were the first, um, it was my committee that first pointed out the challenges with Huawei, the Chinese telecom provider that provides next generation wireless. And thank goodness we have getting them out of our system. Um, we are the, the, the committee, uh, John Cornyn and I from Texas, that said, hey, it is a national security risk that we have seen um, the semiconductor, the chip business, and where we've got one facility up in Manassas, Micron, and I'm working with the governor and others on trying to make sure we bring additional semiconductor facilities here to Virginia, you know, where we said we got to bring those jobs and that intellectual property back, not only because some of that's gone to China, but we're very vulnerable in terms of how much of our advanced chips are made in Taiwan. Um, and it's just not, it's just not Huawei and chips. It's like, you know, I think back there was Kaspersky, a Russian software entity that we had to get off some of our purchase list. We've gone through Huawei. We're a, a debate at TikTok at this point. One of the things I'm working on, and, and this applies more on the tech side than on, on the farmland side, is we really don't have an entity that can look particularly at foreign technology and its activities in the United States from a national security standpoint. We use a series of other tools like the CFIUS legislation that looks about inbound or outbound investment. That really doesn't work uh, in, in every circumstance. So I think we need a contextual place to do this kind of review so that we're not chasing after the fact, whether it's agricultural purchase or Huawei or TikTok, which by the way has 138 million active American users 90 minutes a day on average and not only collecting information on our kids, but potentially being a network of misinformation and disinformation if those algorithms are being still written and the code is being written in, in Beijing. We need a frame to not do this after the fact, but we need to do it, you know, on a get ahead of the game. And uh, the point I'm going to make less about agriculture, but more about these technology domains where I'm, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm more familiar, is you know, we had to chase after the fact and fix the circumstances with 5G and Huawei after China was already kind of running the table. In semiconductors, we've had to make a $52 billion investment on an industry that we used to completely have in America, uh, and we now have to try to bring it back. Uh, we've lost the solar industry. I think we have a chance to bring some of it back. The batteries that power our electric vehicles, we developed a lot of that technology. We need to find ways to bring it back. But those are still chasing things that have already gone out the door. We need to get ahead of the game on artificial intelligence, on quantum computing, on the questions around advanced energy in a series of domains. I've got briefed on some of the activities happening here in China in fusion energy. It will be a game changer. Synthetic biology, 
not only how we grow our food, but grow our drugs, and, and this even gets into material science, um, so that we don't have to go out years after the fact and put up the kind of $52 billion we did in the past. So we need this systemically. It is something that there is broad bipartisan consensus on. The Intelligence Community Committee, uh, which I'm still proud to claim is the most functioning bipartisan committee in the Senate. I know that's a low bar, uh, or actually in the whole Congress, but we're going to dig into this in a meaningful way so that, uh, again, we're not chasing the horses af after they're out of the barn, but hopefully get ahead of it. Um, so this is uh, an area, and I, again, I think about all of the briefings we had. You know, there's, it's been said there has been no greater you know, wealth transfer than the years and years of intellectual property theft done by the Communist Party of China towards American and other technologies. And be, let me be absolutely clear, though, and this is critically, critically important, um, that when I state this, my beef is with the Communist Party in China. It's with Xi Jinping's authoritarian leadership. It is not with the Chinese people. Look how the Chinese government treats the people of the Uyghurs, the people of Hong Kong. And it is not by any means any kind of reflection on the Chinese diaspora, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans. You know, I, I know our initial, I, my initial fear was that the, the, the killings, murders in, in Southern California were potentially a hate crime. It does not appear to be the case. But it is extraordinarily important that we make that because I can assure you uh, the Chinese Communist Party through, through many Chinese tech tools like WeChat and elsewhere are always putting out the propaganda, whether it's America or Australia or Europe or, or other, frankly, other, uh, other nations in Asia that everything is kind of simply anti-Chinese. And that is not the case. Our, our, our beef is with the regime of Xi Jinping and the Communist Party's authoritarian approach. Long answer, Michael, but important question. And I'm glad that you, Jim, and Jeff are on the line. I mean, you know, next we'll probably get a Mike Gooding. We're going to have all the oldies but goodies. Senator, our next question will be from Mike Gooding with 13 News Now. <laughs> well, I don't know that I'm an oldie, but thank you. And I would second your comments about Jim Spencer. Very true. Amen. Uh, let me ask you about let me let me ask you about uh, Senator Cruz's bill this week that would uh, restore all 8,400 troops who refused to get the vaccine, return them to active duty, and give them back pay if you think that's a good idea. And then while you're talking about the military, how do you think the CNO and the Secretary of the Navy are doing responding to the seven sailor suicides in 2022? Do I think T Senator Cruz's bill is a good one? Absolutely not. I think it would undermine uh, respect for discipline. I think it undermines the chain of command. And... Um, the idea that we are going to retroactively uh, say that you know, what was absolutely healthcare guidance, not just in the military, but across virtually all domains, and now after the fact is going to be undermined, um, what would that do on a future basis in terms of discipline? Um, I think it reflects somebody who's not very familiar with the, with the military, um, number one. Number two, uh, boy, Mike, um, I think the Navy is um, trying to sort through this. Um, I, I, I think these are huge tragedies. I mean, they've been disproportionately on some vessels that need to be dealt with. I mean, the thing that, that I got educated on, um, uh, and, and some of this was taking place obviously down in Norfolk, was um, a number of these sailors who are on this, uh, even spacing the exact term, partial duty status, where they are disconnected from their unit, they may be going through a, a lengthy discharge position, they are working uh, in a facility where they don't have other friends, they may again be part duty, it's kind of almost a way station. Um, I got educated a lot, that seems to be a real challenge and, and what was really productive when Senator Kane and I were down there is we heard not only from the brass, we heard not only from the officers, we heard from the, the social workers and colleagues of some of these sailors who, um, uh, who unfortunately I think took their life and it was, a, it was an eye opener for me. And rethinking you know, the challenges of some of these sailors who may have had mental health issues, may have had other issues you know, may not just be good fits for the Navy, in, in the Navy, and they're sometimes in this, again, uh, partial duty status, where they could be caught for, you know, 
upwards of a year and even more. And how we sort that through, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to look to the Navy to come up with suggestions, but I know Senator Kane and I, and I know that, uh, I'm not sure, but I'm sure the balance of the delegation as well is, is, is going to continue to follow us. I mean, uh, that piece in particular is something I think needs review. Senator, our next question will be with Raquel Martin with Nexstar. Hi, Senator. Thanks for taking out the time. Just wanted to follow up on your statements about TikTok. Would you say that the logical next step is banning TikTok nationwide? I know Senator Hawley introducing legislation this week. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, um, I think it has been appropriate. Remember, the military has banned TikTok. The federal government has banned TikTok on you know, government devices, individual states, including Virginia, have banned TikTok on state devices. I have, my concerns on TikTok are twofold. One, the amount of data that is being collected, disproportionately about our kids. And while TikTok has said time and again, oh, you know, there'll be nobody in China that has access to that data, it's just not the case. There have been reported instances and exposés of Chinese engineers, militias are not getting access to that data. But I've morphed from just the privacy concern to the concern about the fact, again, if 138 million Americans are on TikTok an average of 90 minutes a day, and that, you know, it's not, I'm not accusing the Communist Party of, you know, minute, putting videos on that, that are creating content. I am saying that they can manipulate with the algorithms what kind of content you see. And the, the greatest proof of that is if you look at the TikTok that Chinese kids see, which is about science and engineering and work hard and study hard versus the, the TikTok that our kids see, um, it, it's a very different item. And I don't know how you can wall that off if the software is still being written in, in Beijing and those upgrades on the algorithms continue to flow from that source. Now, I've given the Biden administration uh, two plus years. They've been trying to wrestle to see is there a way to technology-wide split the baby. Uh, I think they've, you know, they're saying they're getting close. I've been pressing them for some time. I think it's really hard. And, you know, I'm, I'm relying on technology experts much greater than me. Um, so I'll listen to their case if they can make one. What I think we ought to do, and I, I am very concerned about TikTok, but I think we need a more holistic. We cannot do this like a whack-a-mole. It's TikTok today, it's Huawei yesterday, it's Kaspersky a few years ago. Who knows what it'll be um, tomorrow? We need an approach that says, um, we're gonna look at foreign-based technology and look at it from a national security concern at the outset. And now that could lead to a whole series, including banning, but there could be other steps along the way short of banning the application. I, and let me be clear as well. There's a lot of creative activity on TikTok, and a lot of young people uh, like it, use it on a regular basis. So I think we need to be thoughtful on this, and we also need to be thoughtful in the standpoint that if we, if we arbitrarily go out and hit an individual application and don't have a basis, you know, what I don't want to have happen, since we have a heck of a lot of American social media companies out there as well, whereby other nations then say, okay, now America's done that. We're going to put that same law in place to go after American technology. Now, we don't have to worry about, you know, uh, the PRC, China, because the Communist Party there has already banned um, American applications like Facebook and Google. So, you know, does it lead to ban? Potentially, that is one outcome, and that probably, you know, that, uh, that's potentially one outcome, but we need a more rational process than the one-off one process we have at this point. Our next question will be Mitchell Miller with WTOP. Good morning, Senator, and thanks for joining us. And uh, by the way, regarding myself and some of my longtime colleagues, rather than oldies but goodies, maybe we're the journalism equivalent of deep cuts from classic rock. Yeah, uh, but think, at any rate. Yeah, Mitchell, I put you in that category. I don't think you go back fully to the, uh, the governor days, but you're pretty darn close. So You're pretty close right there. Uh, uh, on a serious note, you've indicated frustration with the lack of information about the classified documents that have been discovered. What are your thoughts that you, the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, are apparently still not getting the information you desire from the DNI? And more broadly, do you think new protocols for classified documents need to be developed or codified 
into some type of legislation for the executive branch. Absolutely on both. And let me explain. Um, you know, we have a responsibility, a constitutional obligation as in our role of oversight of the intelligence community to make sure that our sources and methods in the intelligence community would, uses and the actual intelligence that protects our national security is not put in jeopardy. And the notion that there were documents at President Biden's home and at President Trump's home, and it appears now at, at Vice President Pence's, um, we got to find out if those documents have violated American national security. It's not our job to figure out whether they were misplaced or mishandled. That's the Justice Department's job. And I want to be fair to the Director of National Intelligence in that she originally was prepared to brief us back in the September-October time frame. What's changed has been the notion that a special prosecutor has been appointed in both the Biden and Trump case, and somehow that special prosecutor trumps any obligation uh, they have to the intelligence community. That's just not tenable. Because we know that you, the special prosecutors have an unlimited timeline. We could go months and potentially years before we find out whether these documents, uh, potentially if they fell into the wrong hands, could violate our national security. So uh, you know, when the director says she has to defer and default to the special prosecutor in the Justice Department, uh, I don't think that is a tenable position. And yesterday she heard loud and clear from virtually every member who spoke, regardless of partisan affiliation, that this is not the way it operates. And I'll be clear, remember, we did a Russia investigation for years when there was a special prosecutor in place in the case of Bob Mueller. There are needs to deconflict, and our committee has shown in a bipartisan way we are serious, we know how to handle documents, we know how to respect sources and methods. And Frank, quite honestly, when people say, well, a lot of them are old, probably the chances are that they may not have a huge cause for harm. But we don't know. I don't even think Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden would want us to have that kind of an intelligence assessment. So um, this is something that uh, you're going to see. There were some of my colleagues on the Republican side started making threats. I'm not one to make threats, but I wanted to be completely unequivocal that the current position of this administration is not tenable. We have an Article I responsibility to make sure that we protect the sources and methods and the content of the American intelligence community and to make sure that it is not jeopardized. And we're going to do that. We're going to do our duty. And I hope it doesn't end up in some kind of confrontation. I hope that the administration will realize that it is an untenable position. Um, but uh, time will tell, and, and we are we are focused. Now, and, and coming to the second issue, I also believe, as the committee that oversees this intelligence, um, that it is our job to take on a systemic way, uh, and I've already talked to Senator Rubio, and I've had a lot of my members in the committee input, that we need to look at both classification, because clearly we overclassify. We've known that for years, but it's always one of those secondary issues. How we handle documents when senior government officials leave government and how they're properly stored and protected. And I think, again, uh, my hope is that you will see um, broad bipartisan legislation coming from our committee that tries to deal with this issue, which has been bubbling for years, but now is brought to the forefront of, of, of the American public and, frankly, all members of Congress. Senator, our next question will be Jacob Hunziker with WSET. Good morning, Senator. Thank morning, you for the time. Kind of picking up off of that topic with the classified documents, I just kind of wanted to ask your thoughts about what you think should happen next for President Biden, for former Vice President Pence. Um, you know, how do you think that they should be held accountable um, with these classified documents and the seriousness of, of what has been found? Well, a couple of points. One, um, even though we may overclassify, these documents are classified now, so we got to follow the rules. And the question of what the consequences are legally, the qu consequence, the question of were these documents properly handled, how did this happen, that is totally appropriate 
for the special prosecutor and the Justice Department to pursue. And, you know, I'm anxious to hear what they have to say, but I got no, you know, that's not, my job is not to do that oversight of mishandling of documents. Um, that's the Justice Department's job. My job as intelligence chairman is to make sure that the content of those documents doesn't disclose sources and methods or key American intelligence that if it was found its way into an adversary's hand could jeopardize our national security. And the idea that we are going to put in some interminable time before the special prosecutor deems that it's okay to brief a Article I Congress, and we have appropriate security, and our committee has shown our ability to do this responsibly, you know, we are not going to wait on that. We have a job to do. Uh, and again, my hope is the administration will, will, um, uh, will recognize that, and I think... Um, and again, I, my, my beef is not entirely by any means with the Director of National Intelligence. She was prepared to do this. Protocols have been in the past. You defer to the special prosecutor. In this case, um, that is not a tenable position. And I believe she heard loud and clear from all the members of the Intelligence Committee, Democrat and Republican supporters and, and uh, critics of the administration that were all on the same page on this. Senator, we only have time for one more question. It will be Matt Demling with WRVA. Matt is Matt also. Answered my hold on. Matt is also. I got. I know we got it. We're times out, and I'm, I'm. I'm talking too long. I'll get shorter on the next one of these. But Matt falls into the category of, of uh, classic rock, uh, oldie but goodie, or whatever as well. So Matt, I'm glad you're on as well. But thank you, Senator. Um, you've sort of answered my question, but I'll ask it more directly. Do we have an overclassification problem? We have an overclassification problem. The number of times I go into a secure space, we call them skiffs, and read about something that I've read on the front page of the Washington Post, the Richmond Times Dispatch, or the New York Times is uh, over the top. And I think that overclassification problem then potentially uh, allows officials um, maybe to treat uh, that classification without the pro appropriate respect. We got to still honor the process, the rules that were in place, and if there were violations on handling, that has to be dealt with. But it is time for us, the Congress, to you know, do what we've always talked about, and again, actually here, Director Haynes has been more forward-leaning than most about how we sort through that classification process and frankly, declassify more information. The more transparency, the better. We've got to protect sources and methods, and we've got to protect key information from our adversaries. Uh, but there is a, a wide swath of information that needs to be declassified. And let me just add, Matt, that one of the places this also rears its head is then in the security clearance process. You know, it, the administration's moving forward on this. They hope to make sure that, you know, we can get security clearances down to 180 days. But I can tell you, you know, we are not getting, let's take the CIA, which still unfortunately has the, the longest time frame. If it takes you more than a year to get a security clearance and you're being offered 3x the money to go to Northern California and work for a tech company, even if you're a great patriot that wants to do that mission, you know, you can't wait a year plus to be able to start your job. And um, this whole question of security clearance, and we, we have a lot of folks, particularly in the contractor industry all across Virginia, who get put in... in, in uh, real challenges of doing their jobs. I, my hope is we'll keep moving the ball on security clearance reform, that we will deal with the classification problem, that we'll also take on a better process so that elected officials, as they leave government, and frankly in government, know how to handle these documents and how to dispose of them when they're finished. Um, it's a big piece of work, but it's, it's time to get it done. And that was all the time we had. Thank you. And for those of you who are waiting, sorry if, if you'll get to my team, the questions, we'll try to answer them individually. Obviously, I've, I'm a little rusty and, and went on a little long on some of these. I'll try to be sharper and, and shorter next time. And for all of you, um, again, uh, classic rock or classic uh, uh, Motown uh, questioners, um, thank you for being on and a special thanks to and Jim to a, a great, great career. Thanks, everybody.